Okay, so I, I propose to start on time because uh, we still have a, a big session uh, this afternoon. Uh, so welcome um, you for um, the second part of, uh, of the session on uh, Copernicus and Inspire. So it's called the win-win approach for better monitoring the implementation of EU environmental uh, policies. And uh, so uh, I just would like to recall, maybe, maybe not all of you attended this morning, so we had uh, a first part of the session this morning with very interesting presentations. We had a good overview of uh, Copernicus state of play and uh, so the data policy. Uh, uh, we had also uh, very interesting presentations on uh, access to reference data for the, uh, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service and the land service and uh, so we had uh, the perspective of the of the services uh, service providers and we had also the perspective of uh, euro geographics and uh, nmcas uh, on that so um, why uh, is uh, is it called a win-win win-win approach for better monitoring uh, so first of all, uh, as I said this morning, uh, 2014 is a very important milestone for, Copernic for Copernicus with the adoption of the new regulation on the Copernicus program and uh, so there is a, a, a huge budget for the period 2014-2020 with uh, almost 4 billion euro. Uh, this budget, uh, a large part of it is for, uh, is dedicated to the space component, developing and launching satellites and so on and so on, but there is also uh, almost 20% uh, which is dedicated to services and including uh, in situ uh, uh, components. So it's quite uh, important um, for producing this added value uh, information. Uh, space data are needed, but they need also to be combined with in-situ data, and that's where we have also the link uh, with Inspire. This li link is, an, is essential because for producing added value, you need access to reference data, and as we discussed this morning, so the access to reference data is started to be implemented, so we have a lot of progress done, but still a lot of uh, challenges, uh, which were explained by uh, by the speakers this morning. So we'll continue uh, this afternoon, uh, and um, so uh, the session uh, this afternoon will be will encompass a presentation uh, on the um, the atmosphere service. And so then we will have a presentation uh, of uh, my ocean marine service. And um, then we will move back a little bit to uh, land monitoring with a presentation of the eagle uh, data model and helm, which is the harmonized European land monitoring. Then uh, we, uh, we will have a presentation from uh, a Danish uh, a representative on national perspective uh, regarding the link between Inspire and, Inspire and Copernicus and maybe the gaps to be bridged between the, co the two communities. And then uh, the last presentation will be uh, on the evolution of the Copernicus ESA, which is the European Space Agency uh, Coordinated Data Access System. So I will uh, give the floor directly uh, to um, Vincent Henri Peuch uh, from ECMWF, uh, who will present the Copernicus Atmosphere Service. So the floor is yours, uh, uh, Vincent Henri. And uh, what I suggest is to take the questions uh, at the end of the session, and if we have time to to have a, I mean, a round table, so we will uh, we will try to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josiane, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to address uh, this uh, audience in, in the context of the INSPIRE conference. Uh, the challenge that the atmosphere service uh, faces are, are, are slightly different from the one that, are, that the land service, for instance, face. In a sense that, uh, for a large part, the atmosphere service, the Copernicus atmosphere service, is uh, uh, something which has been created with GMS in the past in the, in the different countries. There were existing uh, information pieces, either based on observations 
conservation or on modeling and really bringing that together uh, is and, and developing uh, uh, added value uh, services is, is uh, to some extent a creation. So uh, I'm the uh, coordinator of the MAC2 FP7 program uh, project which is uh, the precursor to the Copernicus Atmosphere Service and I work for ECMWF uh, which is an international organization in the field of meteorology and uh, we are currently negotiating with the uh, European Commission uh, a delegation agreement to operate this atmosphere service as well as the climate change service in the context of operations. So, as I knew uh, I was speaking in, in, in the slot just after lunch, I, s I wanted to start with an example to give you a feel of what we do uh, uh, within the atmosphere service, or rather uh, how the, what, what are the kind of uses that, that the atmosphere service can, can allow. So this is an example which is uh, very timely. Uh, we have a, a user, uh, in that case it's a Dutch, Dutch uh, institute, TNO, and uh, TNO is doing some forecast, air quality forecast, uh, for the benefit of the uh, World Football Cup. So they are delivering forecast of air quality over the different uh, places where matches take, uh, take place. Uh, sometimes it rains, as you've seen on TV, sometimes not. And uh, for some pollutants, there are some degree of concern uh, about the level of air quality. So that's their, their, their mandate and their objective. And to do that, uh, uh, you can't just do a box uh, over the uh, stadium where you have uh, football. You have to uh, 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 account for for all the stuff that, that comes into this place. And this is where MAC uh, supports these activities. Uh, first, uh, you have lots of pollutants that are long-lived and that can travel uh, long distances. This is an example of carbon monoxide, which is a, a pollutant emitted with all combustion processes. It's monitored uh, from space quite uh, quite nicely and uh, one of the products of MAC is to deliver uh, maps uh, and forecast of, of carbon monoxide. So this gives you the inflow of uh, gas phase pollutants but there are also particles in the atmosphere and this is showing you uh, how the uh, particles in particular from, from the Sahara can travel distances, thousands of kilometers and this is a, a, a case which is just uh, for yesterday where you see this plume of dust from the Sahara going all the way to, to uh, Central uh, uh, America. So this is also a, a product which is provided by Mac2. And last but not least, uh, MAC2 is using also uh, satellite information to derive emissions of pollutants from active fires. So all this feeds into the uh, modeling system of uh, TNO in that case to deliver this forecast. All these elements are something which is uh, very complex, very costly to set up, and, and surely the added value of, uh, of the service is to pull resources together at the European scale to uh, allow for such, uh, such applications. So the, uh, the uh, thread of activities that have led us to the situation of the atmosphere service today is depicted here. Uh, just for the fun, I, I show you the different logos of this GMES and Copernicus program, which is also showing the uh, balance of the program between a pure environmental monitoring program, which was uh, its first uh, goal, to a program which now balances this uh, environmental monitoring uh, aspect with uh, a clear uh, growth support and job creation uh, objective. So we've had a, number, a series of uh, projects that have been ongoing to deliver the range of service we are operating today. And these projects have uh, been in close articulation with users. And on a very regular basis, we've been interacting with the users or potential users of the service to uh, develop uh, services that are useful for, for them. The way uh, the system works uh, is pretty simple. Uh, uh, the first step is to acquire observation, a large range, I have a couple slides on that, uh, from satellite and from in situ. Uh, satellite data is not, on, not only the Sentinel data that uh, for, for the atmosphere will be launched in the future, but we have a host of uh, existing satellites. Uh, these observations are processed, they are uh, combined with model uh, at the global scale. So this is a, a, a global modeling system, which is, uh, I can say, unique in the world. Uh, no other continent has a, a system of such, uh, of such complexity uh, and quality uh, developed. 
and this uh, global system delivers a number of products. I will come back to that, late, to that later. And also feeds boundary condition at the limit of uh, Europe to deliver uh, European air quality uh, products. And these products, in fact, are not a single realization because uh, air quality uh, requires uh, assessment of uncertainty. And so what we deliver is based on a multimodal approach, which allows us not only to deliver a forecast, but also uh, an, an, an estimate of the uncertainty. And all this goes and is disseminated to a range of users. So I, I, I pasted the uh, Inspire logo there because Inspire is very important for, for the service. Both on the input data acquisition side, uh, we are speaking for a, a large fraction of the, uh, these services near real time, and also on the product dissimilar side, as we deliver a, a range of uh, maps, uh, model output, uh, time series uh, to, 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 to meet the, the needs of the users. The, the challenge that we have in the atmosphere service uh, is that, uh, compared maybe to the geographic domain, we have a, a very uh, wide range of observing systems. Uh, so this is uh, depicted on this uh, slide. Uh, there are uh, observations at the ground. So there I have uh, uh, the logo of EA. EA is coordinating the IONET. Uh, and so the air quality uh, monitoring uh, observations uh, done in the country flow through the EA and to the service uh, to uh, allow us to to have the observations at the surface of Europe for the main pollutants. But we uh, rely also on research network, for instance, uh, equipping uh, commercial aircraft, balloons, uh, ground based stations, boats, trains, and, and of course, uh, satellites. So we are dealing with a, a very heterogeneous range of, uh, of uh, observation sources. For the satellite, I won't go in detail in the context of this presentation, but we have a range of very different satellite instruments of very different uh, spatial resolution and, and uh, accuracy that, that we take on board into our system. So our system uh, uh, must be seen as a, a, a big uh, data crunching machine. So we are far from a model where we have one observation which, uh, which we transform into one information through a certain proce pro process. What we have is, is a multiple uh, information source and we deliver a multiple product output. And to give you a feel of the uh, number of, uh, so this is focusing on, on a satellite only, uh, we cur currently uh, handle over 80 individual satellite uh, information to produce our daily uh, products. And we will be soon in the range of 100 instruments. So it's really a multiple input, multiple output uh, system. And this relies uh, on uh, satellites uh, which are operated by, European, uh, by the European Space Agency, uh, UMETSAT, uh, but also by our American and uh, colleague from Asia. So we do all this to deliver services to the users. Uh, these services are all available on uh, this uh, portal. Uh, we have an online catalog uh, which uh, give access to quick looks and to data. We have over uh, 200 uh, individual products. And to give you a feel, they range from information on European air quality at a resolution of approximately 10 kilometers. Uh, information on global atmospheric composition uh, in the troposphere, so that's uh, uh, large fire plumes, dust event, etc. Uh, we have information on uh, radiation, UV and solar radiation, as well as on the ozone layer. And last, we have information on the surface fluxes of key greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, methane, uh, protoxide. We have information also on fires, as I showed for the uh, case of Brazil, and more generally, on, uh, we have a, a lot of work on emissions, anthropogenic emissions, over Europe and at the global scale. To give another example, uh, the, this is uh, a, an event which, was, which uh, had uh, quite some impact in, in, in the UK in particular, as there was uh, last month uh, uh, quite a significant plume of uh, Saharan dust reaching the, the UK. Uh, it made the news because uh, David Cameron has had to cancel his uh, morning job, but it had more impact of, uh, of course. And in order to do a forecast like this, uh, you have to have very accurate meteorological conditions 
solution to uh, predict the amount of dust that will be uplifted from the source area. Then correct meteorology also to uh, predict how this will uh, be transported uh, in the atmosphere and as well as uh, observations to correct uh, for, for, for the forecast as the time, as the time goes. So this is a, a nice application, but uh, I wanted to show uh, an example of how this can support uh, economic uh, growth. And this is an example from one of our users. It's a, a SME in Slovakia, and uh, their, uh, their focus is to uh, deliver service to, uh, to estimate the uh, potential yield of uh, solar installations. So they are interested in uh, using uh, information uh, to uh, answer their customers whether uh, installing uh, a solar uh, plant or a solar facility at a certain location will be worthwhile or not investment. Uh, in the past, uh, this SME or in, in this range, there was lots of problem to account uh, for uh, extreme values with the uh, pre-existing approaches. So the estimate that they could deliver to their users uh, was biased because of the, uh, the lack of capability to address these uh, informations. Using the uh, aerosol information that Mac delivers, uh, this changed completely the scene and the quality of the uh, estimate, so this is the red uh, curve, it is now matching the blue curve, meaning that uh, the independent uh, observations is perfectly well reproduced by the model which is based on uh, satellite observation modeling and Mac, uh, and Mac data. This means that this company uh, can go to their customers and show that the skill of the forecast they deliver is much better than the majority of the uh, field, uh, which is still having uh, issues of the order of 10% uh, uh, in, in the assessment, which can make a, a big difference in terms of uh, investment. So uh, Copernicus uh, not only monitors the environment, but also uh, works toward growth. So I'm going now to the uh, more inspired part of my uh, talk uh, to say that uh, the uh, atmosphere service or, or MAC2 uh, lies in between uh, a number of worlds. Uh, there is a framework of the ISO 19115, of course, on geo uh, geospatial metadata. And uh, we have uh, the uh, profiles uh, coming from Inspire, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, um, uh, mandatory in the, in the context of Copernicus. And at the same time, uh, having uh, our origin in the meteorological community, uh, we want also to uh, be compliant with uh, uh, the WMO information system, which is also implementing similar uh, applications and uh, we try to uh, have an approach which is uh, combining uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, intersection of both worlds. Just to, to speak briefly about the WM information system, which uh, I don't think there was a presentation in, in the context of this conference. This is the new uh, WMO uh, information system. Uh, in the meteorological community, as you know, exchanging data is a, a very old uh, tradition. It started in the 1850s already with the realization that uh, people needed to exchange information. Uh, of course, there was a realization that uh, exchange of data was essential, not the realization that open data was essential. And we are still uh, uh, progressing, uh, this community is still progressing in this, uh, in this direction. And the WIS <coughs> is certainly uh, an evolution in this domain. It's a system which is based on a number of uh, so-called JISC, so it's unfortunate that this, the acronym clashes with the uh, name of the GMS in situ coordination project. Here it's uh, global information system centers that all catalogs. Uh, these catalogs uh, are linked with uh, data center, uh, data collection and production centers, a number of national centers, and these are in articulation not only with the meteorological community but with the wider world. So the WIS is a, a system which is uh, open, and this is a big evolution compared to the to, to the uh, existing uh, system for transmit for transmitting data. So that's uh, the this uh, WIS is a big asset that, that we want to, uh, to use, uh, not to uh, reinvent the wheel, of course. At the same time, we want to implement uh, inspired principles uh, to deliver the services. So the uh, metadata is, is an area where we've been working a lot in the last uh, couple of years, and uh, it solves uh, the problem of interoperability that, that we have. Uh, I've given only two examples, but you see that the, the scope of the use of the data is very different, and the skill of the user is very different. And, and and our main concern in, in, in this uh, first phase, where Copernicus is not as known as it will be hopefully in uh, four or five years, is that it aids discovery, access, and retrieval. 
Uh, of course, metadata should not be added, uh, pasted onto the data, but really created along, along the, the, the path of uh, elaborating the, the data. So this is a principle that we've been elaborating. And the major challenge that we face in our field is that uh, we lack control vocabulary. So for many of our products, uh, we don't have the vocabulary to describe the metadata properly. So we can do things on our own, in our uh, own uh, context, but this is not very helpful. So uh, we work at the global level to agree on uh, defining uh, the needed vocabulary for, for things which are not existing. So this is actually uh, hard work. I will not go into detail. Uh, I have a number of colleagues in the context of the atmosphere service who have been working, uh, uh, putting the metadata uh, together with the 200 and plus uh, services that we, that we deliver. And this uh, allows uh, then to uh, test the data. So this is a result of tests that we do on the uh, Inspire uh, GeoPortal to, to check that our metadata is Inspire compliant. And this allows us also to start uh, disseminating uh, this data using the, uh, the WIS. And this is an example we have uh, tested with uh, 10 products that we have put uh, into, the, into the WIS system uh, using the uh, uh, Global uh, Information uh, Center in, uh, in, in Exeter, uh, run by the Met Office. So we uh, included uh, our metadata uh, in this uh, GISC and rapidly other uh, GISC in the world, so the one of Meteo France in Toulouse and the one uh, of Australia in Melbourne, picked up uh, the information. And now if you uh, go to, if a user goes to the, this, uh, this uh, data center in Melbourne, it's very easy to get the MAC data just by including MAC. You get the product and you have a direct link to the plots, to the data, and to the uh, WCS or WMS uh, service, la layer of services that we have uh, developed in, in, in the service. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, this uh, work of, uh, of uh, working on the metadata is now paying off, uh, really, because we have this global uh, visibility. So uh, uh, we have more tools, of course, to, to access this data. And I come to my slide of, uh, of conclusion. Uh, so what uh, the Atmosphere Service and Mac to the pilot service delivers is a, a range of products on the regional and global scale. And we are in readiness for the operation phase, uh, expected to start in, in, in one year of time. Uh, this, is really a, a European, this has really a European dimension. Uh, there is a, a number, uh, a dozen of uh, data provider, of providers of the services, uh, which, uh, we make, uh, which we make transparent to the user, except it's uh, clearly indicated in the metadata, of course. So we, we've built a distributed uh, service provision chain from the acquisition of observations to the delivery of the services. Uh, the uh, Copernicus data policy, uh, as was mentioned in, in the first part of the session this morning, is full, open, and free. And uh, what we observe uh, is that the number of our registered users is now of the order of a few thousands. So it's not yet big numbers, given that we have a global audience. This is a map of where our users are, are from, so it's pretty global. So it's a few thousands, and with, I would say, a couple hundred uh, who are accessing routinely information and data. Routinely means on a daily basis. Uh, uh, so our power users, and this is growing fast. So the fact that we have to comply with Inspire uh, was first taken on board, uh, was taken from the start, but uh, I, I would say uh, rather as a constraint uh, to brought to the, to the system. But now, as I said, it is paying off as the uh, data exchanges, volume variety, uh, really rich maturity, and, and now we cannot afford to do handicraft or ad hoc solutions to ship uh, information to our uh, users or to, uh, to, to, to acquire observations from uh, a host of uh, observations. So many uh, challenges uh, have been addressed uh, are, are still ongoing uh, in the context of Copernicus. Uh, we address uh, the question of data variety, uh, questions specifically of near real-time data transmission uh, and this uh, lack of control uh, vocabulary. Some aspects are transverse, and there the EA has played a, a key role and will continue to play a key role uh, uh, in, in Copernicus. And some aspects are specific and, and, and thus addressed in, in the service. And the last thing is that the, the service has really a, a global dimension, and so that's why uh, using the WMO information system is, is really uh, instrumental to provide us the infrastructure to reach uh, users uh, at the other side of the, of the earth. Thank you very much.
Thank you uh, very much, uh, Vincent Henri, for this uh, uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so it, there is a long tradition of uh, using satellite data in the, the meteo, uh, let's say, domain, and uh, so it's a very well structured community. Uh, so we are building a lot. Uh, we built a lot uh, Copernicus services on this uh, example uh, for the global dimension in particular. But uh, let's say they have already well established data flows, and uh, thank you for explaining the link, uh, very clearly the link with Inspire. Uh, now we move directly to uh, the presentation of Michel Fabardines uh, on My Ocean um, Marine Service and Inspire. Good afternoon, I'm Michel Favardin and I belong to the Myoshan project management team. So Myoshan uh, is an integrated architecture system and so at the very beginning we have to face with the question of interoperability, standardization methods and implemented standard interfaces and so uh, now with uh, Inspire, we, we can do that in a global way with uh, all the community. So Myoshan and Myoshan 2 projects are the precursors of the Copernicus Marine Service main component. Uh, since uh, 2009, uh, they, they provide an access free and open to the ocean monitoring and forecasting information to the users, and it is based on a system of system concept. So, um, a quick overview of, uh, of the history of Magnusion. So, it started in 2009 as an FPSET uh, project uh, to set up a European integrated system and open the service to the users. Now, since uh, 2012, uh, Myoshan 2 project uh, to, uh, take uh, the, the floor and to develop and improve the service. Uh, Myoshan 2 project will end in, in September 2009, uh, two, sorry, two, 2000, uh, 14. It means that the project will end before the operational marine service will start. So there is a little project, Myoshan 2, follow on, making the bridge between the end of Myoshan 2 and the start of the operational marine service. So Myoshan. Myoshan, it is 59 partners all around Europe using space data and in-situ data models, operational chains, organized as a service team and connected together in a single pan-European system. 59 partners, 14 main operators and 12 production centers organizing four thematic assembly centers dealing with observation for sea level, ocean color, temperature, ice and wind, and in situ. And seven monitoring and forecasting centers for models for the seven areas, six regional areas, and global ocean. My ocean production function, so it's the tax, the tax dealing with the observations and the MFCs for the models producing analysis and forecasts. This from space data and in situ data. There is also a central information system who is there to control, ma manage the meta metadata and monitoring of all the system. And the user interface is provided by a website, a web portal. So this is really an integrated system at the system level, service level, but also service process level. 
regarding the service provided by my ocean. So, the, the service access is done through a single and ac easy access point of, for the users. This web portal provides access to Discover through the catalog, open and free. The search, the view, and the download services. There is also a specific team for the user support, the service desk. The catalog of product, Myosin catalog of product, today is 124 products. It's about uh, 500 data sets. Dealing with currents, temperatures, salinity, surface wind, sea level, sea ice, biogeochemistry, and provided analysis, reanalysis re in real time and forecast. This for, as I said before, seven areas. My ocean users since the beginning, there is an increasing number of my of users. 1,200 in April 2012 and more than 3,400 in February of this year. And this in 87 different countries. This with a fair repartition in application areas for marine and coastal environment, climate, seasonal weather forecasting, marine resources, and marine safety. And as you can see, half of the users are coming from university and research. My ocean and Inspire. As I said, it's a story from the beginning, even when Inspire was not uh, Inspire. So, this, my ocean is linked to these points of the Annex 1 and Annex 3. Regarding the implementing rule, metadata and data specifications are fully compliant with INSPIRES and meet the ISO standards. The metadata are, are accessed uh, through the my ocean catalog and uh, all the data are in NetCDF format. This is commonly implemented all over MyOcean. The network services implemented, search and discover, view and allow. The discovery service. No authentication is requested. It's the CSW interface specifications are met. And um, recently, we, um, we implement a cache for the, on the catalog browser to uh, improve uh, the, um, the performances. Regarding the view and download, the view, it's uh, fully inspired compliant. No authentication is requested. Regarding the download, here there is a specificity. The download uh, is available for registered user. This, because we have to answer to a very important requirement for uh, regarding the um, the performances, the usefulness, and this we can, this too, because we have to monitor the users for this, so we have to put the registration in place, but we will soon, very soon, have to change this because of the new data policy, and we are dealing with the compromise to still uh, monitor users to provide uh, the, the good report into EC because it was uh, requested, but also 
uh, to uh, be compliant with the new data policy. So this is a little challenge for us now. Regarding performances, uh, uh, for this point, we have to admit that there is a very strong constraint performances for such um, uh, a system as, as Myosian distributed because we rely a lot on the subsystem capacities. And so uh, it's difficult uh, to, hard to reach and hard to test because the condition for testing, for example, testing uh, uh, 10 times per hour, it's uh, for uh, a pre-operational system as Myosian, it's very heavy for the system. So we may test or performance test it, but we adapt. We adapt uh, the conditions and for example, we make one check every hour instead of uh, 10 uh, per hour. And the performance Test at uh, today are only done on the WV, WMS only, which is anyway one of the most demanding interfaces in terms of quality of service. And um, we implemented also performance monitoring tool, but only on the view and get capability as a first step. Capacity. Capacity is not done yet, to, because it, it has a, really an impact on operational users. This is um, an overview of the last uh, performance test campaign we made. And so as you can see, uh, we are quite good, even if the condition is uh, we adapted them. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you. I tried to be quick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So it was very clear again. And uh, so um, I move now to, uh, so I, as I said, we come back a little bit to the land uh, uh, service and we will have now the presentation by Stefan Arnold on ego data model and uh, Helm harmonized European land monitoring. Thank you. No, that's, that's another one. So no need to plug this one in. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, I'm representing here today the Eagle Group, the EINET uh, Action Group on Land Monitoring in Europe. And we are some more people and these four names you see here were involved in the presentation today. So 
I speak about the Eagle data model and the outcomes of the Helm project. Uh, there was an FP7 finance project. Um, the longer name was Harmonized European Land Monitoring as a contribution towards better land information, harmonization and inspire compliance. That's what I'm speaking about today. That's the content of my presentation. And briefly, I speak about the given situation of land monitoring and how we classify landscape. Then uh, I speak about some criteria that a data model should fulfill. Um, then jump into the Eagle concept and explain some uh, details about it and its structure of the data model. Then uh, say something about further steps and future perspectives and in the end conclude with the Helm roadmap or an extraction of that. So, um, some words about how we were setting up classification systems to describe landscape. Um, there are lots of um, applications of land cover and land use information. So many classification systems arose from that process. And um, did I jump a slide maybe? I don't know. No. Um, so the, the, the reason why there is so many classification systems is uh, that we focus on different aspects on land cover or land use, that uh, um, data collection methods are varying from each other. We work on different scales. Um, it's a tailored to purpose definition of classes, so not every classification system can answer the question of another application. And um, that leads to some incomparable precision or degree of uh, classification details in the, in the, de in the definitions. And also, um, the field of land cover is not always covered completely by a single land uh, classification system or the land use part. So uh, it, has a, it's, it goes together with a focus on several aspects. So um, previously, uh, classification systems were set up um, by, let's call it, two main drivers. One is the specific user need, the questions that he has on, on landscape in general and the constraints that he has, how to extract information about landscape from, from sources of information. And these constraints are uh, budget constraints. Um, it's expensive to collect information. Um, there are technical constraints. When we speak about land cover, it's always connected to remote sensing, so you have to have um, um, computing power and data storage capacities or you just don't have access to the information you need, maybe because of the combination of the two first reasons. So one example of this is Korean land cover. The classification system of Korean land cover was set up in the end of 80s, beginning of 90s, and um, was uh, bound to the technical capacities by that time. So that was the background how the classes were set up and defined by that time, which is still in use for today. Now we have a kind of different situation um, because uh, with the Sentinel program of the Copernicus uh, uh, framework ahead, these uh, satellite data will be uh, freely available for everybody accessible and on a very high repetition rate. Also, the USGS, um, who has run the Landsat system for long times, has opened their archives and also has put into orbit a new Landsat 8 satellite and these data are also freely available. So this is another uh, situation now and also uh, the technology has advanced so we have now much bigger storage capacities and processing um, capacities and higher spatial resolution so we are in a situation where we can extract much more information out of uh, our sources of information at lower costs. So um, how should the criteria look like for a data model that can answer in general questions of, of land monitoring? So from the conceptual point of view, <clears throat> it should clearly separate between the land cover information and the land use information, because both of them can have different change dynamics and um, land cover cannot really overlap, but land use can overlap. So it has to be mutually exclusive and comprehensive list for land cover components, not anymore. <coughs> we speak not about classes anymore, but components. 
It should be applicable on different scales. It should be applicable on national and on European level. That's why we're here about. And um, it should be somehow possible to transfer the information content between classification systems. It should be Inspire compliant <coughs> and it should support the bottom-up approach, so the production of uh, data sets that are applied on European scale based on national data sources. So what's also important is to be able to integrate parameters um, like, for example, uh, crown cover density or soil ceiling degrees, which is not a class, it's, it's a parameterized information. And the data model in the end should be flexible in its structure for uh, adding new model elements in future times when questions come up that we nowadays cannot think of but later on can fit into the data model without the need to change the whole classification system. So there's a, another list from some thematic point of views. Like I said just now, um, there should be a place to store information about soil ceiling degree or crown cover density and some other um, characteristics on landscape that I will not uh, further speak about now, but just to have it for later on. So what we did in the um, HELM project was to um, take this uh, criteria that we were collecting within uh, uh, this uh, project work and we're um, making a cross table um, and showing in lines very briefly the, the yeah, abbreviations of, of the criteria that we are we're collecting and checking it against some known classification systems or data sets if they fulfill more or less these criteria that we were uh, setting up. So this is not the complete table, but just to show how it looked like. And there were several European or also some national examples. And we were giving some number codes if the criteria is fulfilled or not, or partly. So um, to the data model itself now, it is um, separated into three main blocks. The first block describes the land cover with land cover components, not classes anymore. Um, the, the, the second block is about land use, which is m very much oriented at the Inspire hierarchical land use classes, the HELUX classes. And the third block, and this is um, the most flexible part, um, describes some characteristics like um, biophysical parameters or uh, spatial patterns or anything that cannot be put into a class but is still important to understand the landscape in total. So this is how the matrix, we call it, looks like. It's an, it's an Excel sheet, more or less. Mm -hmm. And this is the land cover part. And it is um, hierarchically structured from top to bottom. And you see uh, on the top three main categories. It's abiotic. Um, land cover components, vegetation, and water surfaces. And they are further separated into artificial surfaces and natural material surfaces, and so on. Likewise, on the vegetation part, you have woody vegetation, trees, shrubs, herbushes, then, then grasses here. So the components itself, you can find them here at the bottom line. These are the components mainly. So you will not find something like mixed forest in here because mixed forest is not a land cover component, it's a class and it is combined by using um, coniferous trees and broadleaf trees, just to give you one example. The second block of the matrix is the land use information. This is also an extraction, it's much wider normally but it would, it would not fit on the screen here. So it is oriented uh, on the um, economic sectors um, and that's very much similar to the um, Hilux classes um, with the primary production sector, um, secondary or industry, service, um, tertiary sector, and so on. So here you find agriculture, forestry, nothing like cropland or something like this. Or further down here, there's residential use. The third block of the matrix are then now the um, characteristics that further can describe landscape. So this is just um, more or less logically compiled. We have some land management characteristics like cultivation, 
patterns or cultivation measures, irrigation, fertilization, and so on, or spatial patterns, uh, built-up patterns, do I have single blocks or street blocks or big skyscrapers, or also some uh, other information about ecosystem types, and that's something you are probably very familiar with, like something like wetlands or um, semi-desertic uh, landscapes, you can find it here. It's not a land cover class anymore in that sense, but a way how to describe landscape, and it's taken out of the land cover block and put here inside the characteristic block. Or status, for example, burned areas or damaged, so you can describe the, the condition of a piece of land. And this is the, how it looks like in total, the entire matrix. Here you have the land cover block, I explained to you with the abiotic, the vegetation and the water part, um, purple color, the land use block, and the yellow color, the characteristics block. And what you can do now with this matrix is um, to put it against uh, the classes of a classification system. Here it's the Korean land cover classes. Don't try to read it. And <laughs> you can fill in, <laughs> if you brought your opera glasses, maybe you can. So you can take one class and go through the line and tick mark all land cover elements that are supposed to be inside this class by definition and tick mark the land uses that are connected to that class and also tick mark the characteristics that are, that are relevant for this class. And that's how you go through line by line. We also have created a UML model out of this. Um, which is connected to the to the Inspire specification on, of land cover. That's this box here. That's the, that's the simplified uh, land cover model from Inspire. And plugged into that, we developed this further complex uh, UML chart. And if this is a bit too complicated and you again can't read it, I'll explain it in the next slide a bit easier. Try to remember uh, these colors: red, green, blue. So. Um, a piece of landscape like a golf course is quite difficult to describe what's all in there besides you know it's a golf course. So <clears throat> you can start with um, to, to describe landscape by the land cover components, the abiotic block, vegetation and water. So here you would find sand on a golf course, here the grasses and the lakes. These all have can have several characteristics so for example, the grasses here, you can add some information that it's mowed regularly every week or something. And for the water part, it's not salt water, it's fresh water. And they um, compose together a, a land cover unit. In this case, the golf course is the land cover unit. And the golf course can also have its own characteristics. So they come together to this unit. And the land use attribute describes it as a, a sportive ground, saying golf course. So golf course is not a land cover class anymore. It's a, it's a land use attribute that is attached to a collection of land cover components. Another uh, example here is wetland. Wetland is, is not a, a land cover class anymore. It's a, it's a habitat type, and it's composed by land cover components uh, inland water and reeds and the land use part is nature protection site or recreational area and the characteristics here you have an inland marsh its recreational area the salinity is zero percent for example so it's fresh water and the water re regime would be perennial so it's every time a wetland <clears throat> i can explain it on another um, example of the village i'll jump over it now because time is a bit ad advanced already also, land cover components, buildings, herbaceous plants, land use, residential, and so on. And the eco key message, message here, like an intermediate facet, is that the eagle matrix uh, wants to be uh, function wants to function as a semantic translation tool between classification systems, and for um, semantic analysis of inconsistencies, meaning gaps and overlaps. Uh, within or between classes. And the Eagle model can also be used as a conceptual basis for a future European land monitoring system when you, when you start to map landscape. So it is not 
another classification system, but a more, more a descriptive vehicle for the harmonization of this information. So what is HELM now? HELM, as I said, was an FP7 project uh, from 2011 to 2013, three years. Uh, the participants were mainly authorities and experts in the field of land monitoring from 17 European countries. And the two main objectives were to collect best practices of land monitoring and uh, to create a roadmap towards a harmonized European land monitoring. So <clears throat> the outcome of these considerations were um, looked like this, um, an, a framework scheme. When you want to come from, from the national and subnational level to the European level and derive data from national sources, you need something that matches in between as an intermediate level. And that's where we see the Eagle concept with the matrix and the data model, where everybody can describe his own data as a data producer using the componential description and then translate um, this information in the Eagle concept or in the data model into the nomenclature of other classification systems that are used on a, a European level. This also functions from one side to the other on a national level, of course. And as I said already, it's very close to the INSPIRE specification, so it's compliant to the land cover and the land use specification so far. So, um, what are the preconditions um, to implement this? Uh, we need a full and continuous user consultation process for national, from national to European level. The uh, existence of European stakeholders who takes the lead in national counterparts, so somebody has to draw responsible in a way to steer this whole process. <clears throat> What's important is a sustainable funding mechanism and legal framework that member states know in advance for their own planning how to react on this um, further steps. We should orient ourselves on the open data policy and long-term planning pave them the way for short-term actions. So some technical and scientific matters, they have to be um, solved, but it's, it's not this major problem. I'll jump over this. So the Helen Roadmap um, concludes like this. Um, the production of pan-European data sets uh, should be based on nationally produced land monitoring data to ensure quality and compatibility of the data as well as source efficiency. The users are most effectively uh, by being evolved through continuous collaboration and participation process. And there should be a balance between European level harmonizations and the autonomy of member states must be preserved in this process. And having said that, the Copernicus program, the document provides a quite good platform to put uh, the HELM concept into action. It is mentioned on two, uh, two places in the document that the Eagle data model and the HELM should be further developed and supported. And the Horizon 2020 program provides a good framework for funding for further development towards an implementation of the HELM roadmap. What's needed here is a precise call that, that we as the land monitoring community can react on. So you can find further information on a booklet that um, was produced. It looks like this. That's also the cover. And here you see, um, with very beautiful pictures inside, um, the, 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 the main outcomes of the tasks that were tackled inside the, um, the project. And it will be also put as a PDF file online on the website of the project. So on behalf of uh, the whole continent, I say <laughs> thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Stefan, for this um, extensive explanation. Uh, so uh, uh, continue to support uh, the, the work on semantics and data model is as important as the production of information, so for harmonization and uh, better integration of uh, different uh, land cover land use information at different levels, let's say. So now let's move uh, quickly to the presentation uh, of the national perspective by uh, Olaf Eggers. Uh, 
from the Danish administration, Danish administration on Inspire and Copernicus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josiane, for, for this opportunity. I hope and you good afternoon, okay. everyone. Yes. I think we have the presentation available. I yes. just think me, I need, oh, here it is. Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, first of all, I'm Ola Vegas from the Danish um, Geodata Agency. So uh, I've been invited to uh, to give this uh, view. It's more a policy view than the... Is it not loud enough? I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's more a policy view than a technical uh, presentation, which we've seen until now. Um, just to give you the context, I mean, it's always interesting to see the different perspectives or views you have on an issue depending on where you're sitting. Um, and the, the place we're coming from um, is uh, uh, an agency which has uh, a wide range of, of uh, responsibilities uh, which in the, in the field of um, geodesy, mapping, nautical charting, cadaster, and last but not least, infrastructure. Um, we have, as of last year, a mission um, to ensure that data provides as much benefit to society as possible. This is kind of a higher level approach than we've had previously within the mapping agency. Uh, and um, uh, the vision is um, that the data used in a coordinated fashion by the public sector creates coherence in the digitization process, increases quality and efficiency in the public administration to, benefit, to the benefit of the citizens and corporations. So a very high level approach. The ones of you who were here yesterday morning saw the presentation of the Ministry of Finance of Denmark uh, and, and heard how um, the Geodata Agency has been um, uh, involved in, uh, in the um, e-government initiative for, for Denmark and closely in the development of one of the streams for good basic data for everyone. Um, there's been very strong influences on in the technical area, but also in the policy area from, from the Inspire side. So these basic data we're talking about on a conceptual uh, and soon realized level in Denmark um, are mandatory to be used. Um, they have to have the right quality for the main applications. Uh, there is a clear responsibility for keeping the ba basic data valid and up to date, and they have to be semantically coherent. So this is uh, the, the basic setup, um, and it's in a very nice flow with uh, our uh, infrastructure model, which we've been using for the last 10 years in Denmark, at least. So back, that was uh, where we're coming from, so to say, uh, and, and now this uh, might be a slightly dramatic drawing, uh, and maybe, and I don't think this is uh, the present uh, state of business, uh, but uh, just to set the scene that there might be some gaps, at least. Um, a little bit of history first, because um, uh, maybe the reason why we were invited to speak today was that we were quite engaged back in the geo regulation times uh, and were influencing strongly the regulation to include um, uh, the member state uh, reference data of the Inspire investments um, and also doing so by directly communicating with the Commission during the, pro uh, the process. Um, the outcome, uh, not only of the efforts uh, of uh, Denmark, but obviously of all the European member states, uh, was um, that um, the uh, Copernicus regulation does uh, acknowledge and also does uh, align to um, the INSPIRE principles. Uh, INSPIRE already had a, a preamble stating that there will be some benefits um, for, for other uh, community initiatives. Uh, and uh, now the present, uh, as of April, um, Copernicus regulation states that Copernicus data should be compliant with member state spatial reference data, as well as implementing rules and technical guidelines of INSPIRE. So everything basically should be okay. Um, if you look at it closer, obviously these are two c completely different programs with different goals and 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 aims. And and, and some of the issues, if you look at, uh, try to analyze why there's not a hundred percent alignment, obviously stem from the different steering mechanisms in these very different programs, um, the sector influence, 
um, very different sectors involved, as you've seen in the other presentations in Copernicus. It's more a closed party within Inspire. Um, the time perspective is definitely a, a big factor. We've seen that in the morning in the presentations. Um, the stakeholder communities, again, are very different. Um, and there's also a financial uh, difference in the approach. Uh, there's a budget behind the regulation, and um, the directive only has, let's say, the, the member state funding, more or less. So this gives you a clash of, uh, of approaches. Um, you could say uh, top-down versus bottom-up. We've seen that during the presentations here. Uh, it's, it's quite obvious that everybody acknowledges that there is something about this. Um, there's also something, we've seen that earlier in other presentations, about short and long-term gains and goals. Um, there's something, an issue regarding the, um, uh, the, the rapid need of, of seamless data and, and the more long-term uh, look to benefits of integrating NSDIs into an ESDI. And, and there's also um, the sector issue on, on a wish to stimulate industry versus uh, data for monitoring the environment. If we just take one of these issues, uh, we also saw something like this uh, this morning. Um, uh, the uh, Inspire implementation roadmap obviously gives us uh, a, a, a slight issue uh, regarding uh, delivery of harmonized data for all of Europe within a very short time period. We're talking about, let's see if I can get this here, uh, 2017 for Annex 1 and 2020 for, for many of the countries for Annex uh, 2 and 3. And uh, forgive me for using this very simple way of uh, superimposing the Copernicus uh, time uh, table, but uh, it's more or less aligned. Uh, and and the, oh, we need to go back. thing you can see is that uh, obviously a lot of the services uh, are to be uh, in, in uh, full production by 2015. And obviously, uh, by 2015, we uh, do not have a lot of Inspire uh, Annex 1 and partly Annex 2 data, not at all, probably. So that is an issue. Um, if we look at the regulation text, uh, this is a continuation of the uh, text, how it landed during the very heavy negotiations uh, in 2010 for the GEO regulation. Uh, it states that um, these, uh, um, at, that uh, Copernicus needs to integrate at European level existing space in situ and reference data and capacities in member states. And then obviously there is this uh, thing about avoiding duplication, which is, has been addressed also this morning. Uh, but you can duplicate, so to say, if you want to read it that way, if, uh, if the, um, the use of existing upgradable data sets is not technically, technically feasible, cost-effective, or possible in a timely manner. So how, I mean, what does that give us? What kind of issues does that give us? Well, from an implementation point of view, the way I, I read it, uh, uh, in the Copernicus Reference Data Access Initiative, uh, which is now being um, run by, by the EA, it's been done with the so-called dual track approach. Um, trying to get hold of as many data as possible, um, and at the same time, uh, um, uh, using and improving uh, existing data sets and, and uh, doing some gap filling. So, so that is, let's say, the approach to, to overcome this issue. If we look at the uh, very uh, practical um, um, implementation for 2014, um, as far as I can see uh, from the uh, work plan in 2014, uh, there's something, uh, there's an action regarding a road network uh, that's one of uh, the actions um, uh, with uh, w where there is a use of um, uh, national road databases with a so-called gap filling um, procedure. And then there is something which I can probably get an explanation from the EEA about. Uh, there is uh, also a mentioning of the uh, EO Hydro update, uh, which is also contained in in a call uh, um, uh, for tender issued by the EEA. Uh, I, I can't really see, I haven't exactly found out how that fits together, but, but the, the recent call for the EEA tender at least, which is a very practical um, 
uh, initiative covers the, the, the first approach, the first part of it covers um, uh, technical support action to harvest national data and make them available, and the second one covers this uh, issue of, um, uh, let's say, further implement the existing um, EU hydro and EU DEM data sets which have been produced um, in 2009. Um, so, if we look at the uh, gap-filling actions, um, the question which also was posed early on uh, today was if this top-down approach uh, regarding production really fits within the development of the spatial data infrastructures in Europe. Uh, I mean, one thing is that we do make these gap-fillings, and uh, uh, the other thing is when we produce them, are we making a once-off production which is going to be exchange for something from the member states or are we producing something which seems to be the case at the moment where we say we produce a data set and please member states take over this data set and correct it which seems to be the other way around of how things should be from our point of view at least um, we believe obviously that these infrastructure principles should be um, followed. Um, the collection of data only once is a very main principle. Uh, that is an issue which we should discuss directly about uh, because obviously there's a need for gap filling, but maybe things could be developed between the Commission, EEA, and the Member States in a different way if we discuss it before the tenders arrive. Uh, uh, and the other thing is that we um, should discuss about the maintenance issues beforehand, before these tenders go out. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a surprise when you are left with a data set to, to update, which doesn't stem from your national reference databases. So one of the things, just to touch on, on, on a couple of, of, of solutions maybe, is um, the ELF which has been um, presented earlier today and also yesterday uh, with the launch. And um, as, as we see it, the ELF could be uh, one of the solutions at least, or platform for a solution. It uh, delivers and collects um, data from all kinds of um, European reference databases and it, it repairs some of the, uh, let's say, some of the issues within Inspire. Um, so, so this could be a platform uh, to solve some of the uh, needs of Copernicus. And this then leads to the question, which we might discuss later on, if the, the CORDA, uh, the Coordinated Reference Data Access, um, which was this lot one, which has been sent out for tender, if this is something which um, can build on, uh, on the ELF infrastructure, or if it's a new parallel infra infrastructure thing. That would be very interesting, I think, for the uh, Inspire community to, uh, to understand. So, the question, is there a, a common path uh, for Inspire and Copernicus? Um, uh, obviously, uh, I don't think there's a choice. <laughs> they, both programs are running, and obviously there is something. Um, what we see is we'd like to, uh, to have, let's say, a new approach to it. Um, uh, the top-down approach we would like to avoid uh, and maybe there's a need to do some of these gap fillings, but uh, maybe not through a top-down approach, but maybe through negotiations and discussions between member states and the Commission and EEA. This will minimize the um, duplication of efforts. Um, we need um, the infrastructure to uh, build on Inspire and the NSDIs. And um, we also need um, the quality uh, and uh, coherence between these gap-filling <coughs> productions and the member state data for things not to be a duplication of work. So do we need to set up something, a big, a big animal, uh, uh, to discuss this? Uh, this is a very complex uh, setup to negotiate things, logically abandoned. Uh, no, it's a lot more simple as we see it. Um, we just need to sit down basically uh, before the tenders arrive and discuss options and possibilities. We can then uh, coordinate developments, um, 
we could maybe underpin the cross-program governance, which we see as pretty weak between Inspire and Copernicus, and we'd like a partnership approach. Um, and that would then uh, provide as much benefit to the society as possible as we see it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Olaf, for this uh, uh, presentations and for raising very important issues and uh, uh, also for your proposals. But um, so I would like to give the floor to EA uh, maybe to have a chance to reply, but uh, at the end of the, the presentations. So uh, now we move uh, to uh, to the last presentation by European Space Agency. So I will ask to be you as brief as possible. I'm sorry for that because we're back in time and uh, but uh, okay. Let's do it like that. And, uh... Okay, hello, my name's Jolyon Martin. I work for the European Space Agency. And I would like to um, discuss a few of the evolutions uh, that the Space Agency has put in place for providing coordinated data access from satellites. Uh, my presentation will be short. Um, we'll, I'll give a few words on the uh, Copernicus program. Uh, the data access and data policy issues that we're fronting at the moment. Um, and I'll highlight uh, the evolutions that we're intending for our data access system, and especially a couple of, uh, of projects which are ongoing to provide uh, what we hope is a better service. The background of Copernicus is well known to everybody, so I'll skip this one in the name of brevity. Um, the only thing to say is that uh, through our evolutions we always have a, um, <coughs> a, a vision of, of providing uh, smooth and seamless transition to new services. So this will be one aspect that we'll be taking care of. Um, we have uh, a new era in the uh, availability of data from um, for Copernicus uh, since we have launched the uh, Sentinel-1 satellites. Uh, um, the, the data access becomes now a real major undertaking for the European Space Agency. With the launch of the Sentinels, we have an unprecedented volume of data products to be delivered. Um, when we count the first, just the first satellite in each of the, the satellite 1, 2, and 3 series, we, we come to a, a volume of 500 megabits per second of sustained delivery of use of products. This is quite a challenge, and this challenge uh, we deal with by providing uh, a network of, of centers, um, both the core ground segment, the acquisition stations, and the processing and archive centers, which are um, interconnected through a very powerful network um, to, to provide our data access. Uh, one of the, I can't resist to, to show some of the first results from since the launch of the Sentinel-1 satellite. Uh, so the Sentinel-1 was launched on April the 3rd and is currently in its um, commissioning phase. Uh, so right now we're working on the calibration and validation of the satellite before uh, opening up the, the full data stream to, to the intended users. One of the challenges that we have is the, the full free and open data policy. Uh, as you can imagine, with such a volume of data and such a demand for the data, we have to take uh, particular care to be able to provide operational services for access to the data to the maximum number of users. <clears throat> We have an evolution, evolutionary uh, approach to this, so we'll be bringing in new services uh, to the data um, uh, as we uh, evolve our ground segment. Uh, um, and one of the fundamental ways that we can provide um, uh, um, uh, operational access is by, um, by putting into place dedicated access infrastructures um, for the needs of the various uh, user typologies. So we have um, access points being put into place for the Copernicus services. These are the core um, uh, Copernicus service projects. 
and different access points uh, for free and open access to everybody. We have also um, uh, specific arrangements for international agreements, access for international agreements, and finally uh, what we call collaborative access um, for the uh, national member states to, uh, the, the ESA national member states to, to obtain cent access to Sentinel data. This is done through a number of infrastructures and a number of um, uh, facilities like international mirrors, national mirrors, etc. Uh, on top of the uh, infrastructures, we provide a common uh, charter of services um, uh, which are available to uh, all users. Um, the, the list here, I will go through quickly, the registration, discovery, view and download uh, are probably well known to everybody. We also have to put into place bulk dissemination services for a uh, large volume of data. In certain cases, we uh, still have to provide um, enormous quantities of data for reprocessing, and this may be done by physical media although we're more and more putting into place um, uh, dedicated uh, hubs, mirror sites for um, uh, further onward dissemination. Um, the, the full set of services that ESA provides includes the emergency service, so still the collection of data from not only the Sentinels, but also the, the contributing missions for the emergency services. We have offline mapping services which allow people to request ad hoc data, uh, again, from the complementary um, uh, contributing missions. And we have uh, further help desk and, uh, and are putting incrementally into place these uh, hosted processing services as well. Um, so a quick summary. Um, at the moment, or up to the launch of Sentinel-1, we've been providing data from uh, over um, uh, 12 different uh, entities um, uh, with over 40 um, uh, space missions. And uh, since the um, launch of the Sentinels, we now have a dedicated infrastructure for, for um, uh, the Copernicus as well. This, uh, these data flows are coordinated through our coordinated data access system, uh, which manages the, the necessary uh, ordering and um, coordination of the data with the, 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 the responsible for the missions and also the, the necessary reporting to the Commission and the, the flow of the, of the data to the, to the Copernicus users. Um, so currently, uh, we've been in operation since uh, 2008. Um, uh, we've been providing um, massive data sets, um, as well as ad hoc uh, small orders for the, um, uh, the European Union's uh, Copernicus projects. Um, and you've seen many of those being referenced earlier in the presentations today. Um, to do this, we have a number of tools. Um, oops, uh, these tools include advertising portals, quota management systems, user management systems, centralized catalog and download services. Um, behind the scenes, we have uh, quality assurance tools, uh, specific um, uh, uh, mechanisms put in place for the emergency satellite tasking, as well as um, uh, facilities for monitoring the, um, the collection of data for the large European coverages. All these uh, provide statistics and reporting as necessary for, for, the, um, for, the, for the overall management of the, of the enterprise. Um, uh, some words about the evolutions that we're putting in place. So um, we're now developing our third version of the coordinated data access system, the CDS system. Um, and this will see the integration of the Sentinels and a massive increase in the data volume which can be disseminated. Uh, in order to prepare for this, we have a number of projects being put into place, one of which is the next generation of Earth Observation User Services, something called NGO, and I'll go in a little bit more detail in this. Uh, a data hub service for the mirroring and further... Two minutes, whoa. Uh, okay, um, 
Okay, so we're taking aboard as well the Inspire uh, principles and um, uh, um, uh, into, into our developments. So the NGO project very quickly um, provides for a, a new um, user interface uh, which will provide um, discovery, view and download using OGC standards. Um, so I have some uh, screenshots, so the usual ser um, catalog search and discovery, uh, providing um, uh, download capabilities via a, a dedicated download manager, and also uh, the web usual web mapping services for the overlay of the, the browse imagery. I wanted to spend, uh, um, so this is coming soon with the commissioning of the Sentinel-1 satellite. I wanted to spend a few words on the Sentinel Data Hub, which is something that we have now available. <clears throat> this is uh, the system that's going to provide uh, free and open access to anybody. This is available now with a subset sample of data from Sentinel-1. Um, the, the main um, uh, facility is the, the access to a rolling archive of Sentinel data products. Um, very much as you expect, there's a, a web interface which allows a search. One of the important things that we want to put into place, or we're putting into place, is uh, a scripting capability so that the downloads may be automated. We're using a particular um, protocol which is called Open Data. This Open Data protocol we're quite happy with. It's allowed us not only to provide download, but also inspection of the data. Since we're dealing with a rolling archive, you can script and um, uh, preview the quality of the data before downloading the data. And uh, to manage the, the massive volumes of data, we're supporting um, uh, download managers um, which, so that you can, again, batch download the, the, and automate the download of the products. Um, I saw some XML in some of the previous uh, uh, presentations, so I'm not so ashamed to have put up some uh, scripting language here as well. The um, uh, Sentinel Data Hub is now available. Here's the URL, senthub.isa.int. It's free and open to register, so please feel free to have a look at our Sentinel data. Currently, we have sample data uh, until the commissioning, in-orbit commissioning review of the satellite, which is due in September, and then full access and uh, also the full details of the API that we have towards uh, this, um, uh, this access will be published uh, following this. And I leave you with uh, a, another image from the Sentinel-1 satellite recently taken. I'm sorry that I'm so rushed, but uh, thank you for your attention anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for this presentation, and sorry for pushing you a little bit uh, to uh, to it quickly. But um, uh, so, if we want to have some time for for discussion, so we're still uh, uh, behind the schedule, and. Um, um, so I would like to uh, to have the opportunity of uh, uh, Christine Mans from uh, European Agency who was supposed to arrive this morning. He's here this afternoon, and uh, I would like to give him the floor because uh, probably he has something to to say uh, on the basis of the presentation made by Olaf and the, uh, other presentation. Thanks, thanks, Josiane. And, and my apologies, it was not the, the spatial data infrastructure, but the transport infrastructure that sometimes still has its hiccups after so many years of development. So, um, Very quickly, a few comments uh, to, to, to avoid any misunderstanding about uh, what might have been put forward here to, to the audience about what I would call how we interpret now the Copernicus regulation. And there I want, first of all, to make clear is there is no, we have exactly the same vision as the word stays in the regulation. So there is no hidden agenda or whatever. Uh, I hope that, uh, that we all can work into the same direction with, with the best intention. However, what we need to know, and if you read the regulation, is we are dealing with operational services. And there is always one problem that we know, timing is against us. And I leave the costs aside. But for me, it's about timing. We need to deliver. There's a strict timing. So what, is, what we want is to implement the regulation as it states, where we want to do it bottom-up, 
use all the national investments that are done. We will not, we are against top-down. We do not want any long, sustainable top-down solutions to implement. I hope this is clear. But what does it mean in practice is that to run an operational service, and that relates to uh, the elements that were mentioned when it comes to reference data access about transport, about hydrography, about administrative boundaries or whatever, you need to have a solution on the table. And then in some cases we have to work out temporary solutions. So the, what, you li what is labeled very often as top-down at this moment on reference data is temporary solutions. We do not want to maintain this data at long term. Inspire, hopefully, will replace this kind of access to reference data. So that is the whole philosophy behind it. And in that sense, we are very, we, we really would like to hope, indeed, what, you, what was mentioned, I think, by Olaf, to improve the governance. How do we deal with that? And that's indeed, I think, there you pointed on the weakness, at the current weakness between the Inspire implementation and what will now happen with the Copernicus implementation. And there also I have my concerns. And that is something where I hope that these conferences, we will have uh, the new governance structure for, Go for Copernicus, which are now being set up, uh, including a user forum with whatever expert groups or how it will work. That I think is that's where we will have to focus on. But, and I, I, I can also speak there, not, not on behalf of the European Commission, but at least we, where we take on board a number of delegated tasks, we are fully aligned with the, the vision that you put forward and even in line with what you nicely presented also of the, the mission even of the Danish uh, ge uh, geodetic agency, yeah, is that as much as the mission, as much benefit to the society as possible. That is exactly what we are also aiming for. So I think there we are on the same line. Um, there is indeed some conversion still needed. The example that was given on, uh, I think, the example of, of Corda, so this system similar to what ESA set up was CDS, we call it Corda, okay, for the Copernicus services. Um, ELF, absolutely, please, hurry up, we need it. That is, that is the kind of message that we want to give. So in that sense, we, we do not want to develop any duplication or a similar system parallel, not at all. That's not what we want for. We need operational systems, and that's also why as part of the delegated task, luckily we can have a quite significant budget available to make use of the Inspire services. We know, and that's also what we will, you will see appearing in the call for tenders, the first, I, I would say till 2016, 2017, it will not be impressive. But we will invest, if I recall correctly, two to three million to make sure that Inspire services made available by the countries are used as input to Copernicus services. And we hope that by 2020, I hope that 100% of the reference data can be connected to Inspire services. But let's see how far we can get. Olaf, you mentioned uh, some, I mean, recommendations or uh, proposals for better coordinating with uh, uh, member states and MCAs, and uh, uh, so um, uh, probably you 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 have some uh, some ideas uh, for putting in place. But uh, in operational terms, how do you see this cooperation? Because, uh, uh, as uh, said by uh, by one of the speakers this morning, uh, coordination needs time, I think it was Eurogeographics, and uh, so there are some players at European level, EA, Eurogeographics, and then NMCAs, and uh, how do you do you see the, the development of, uh, let's say, a, a more integrated approach towards uh, an improvement of uh, access to reference data at national and European level? Okay, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Chris, for the very good reply. I think the audience also applauds that. Um, I, I think, and I also agree that uh, with the new governance set up for uh, Copernicus, uh, uh, there are some new possibilities, but um, I, I do think that if we want to take this further on, we probably need to establish something outside of one of the programs, uh, which is more kind of an umbrella, umbrella um, uh, governance board uh, with, uh, let's say, representation from the main players. And this is not a governance board which is then, let's say, overseeing what the other boards are doing or so, but uh, I think what we actually just need is to talk about the ideas and the developments. 
Um, so that, for example, these ICTs uh, don't come as a surprise and are misunderstood or intentions. It's a lot easier if um, if uh, we could uh, discuss, let's say, the uh, longer longer term um, uh, approach and uh, then go into some of the details on on let's say uh, short term solutions. I know 100% that uh, this is not going to be let's say a democratic board where the member states can. Can, can vote and 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 agree on on the approach, but uh, I think just the exchange of ideas is going to be a great improvement. So the, the the point is that as far as I uh, as I know, but maybe I'm wrong, uh, there is not such a umbrella uh, governance board or organization identified clearly in the in the current uh, Copernicus regulation. So we have already uh, Eurogeographics, we have the NMCS, we have uh, EEA as uh, playing the role of uh, coordinating in situ body. So why not putting in place, uh, I would say, a cross-cutting uh, uh, structure, but uh, uh, then you, you're, you're, you're talking about ITTs, and uh, I think there are two different levels. The first level is uh, coordination mechanism, and then uh, uh, when coming to uh, the production or the transfer of money from the EU uh, to uh, any uh, organization, private or, or public, so then we have to be compliant with our financial rules. And uh, uh, the point is that we are not we are obliged to do open ITT when they are over a certain amount uh, budget. So that's uh, that's the way it is, unless uh, there is in place another mechanism. So now in the in the frame of Copernicus, we have uh, some coordination bodies. They will have direct delegation agreements, uh, and uh, so it's subject to approval by the member states and blah blah, and uh, so um, yeah, by uh, internal mechanism. In the, in, in, in the Commission. Uh, but then, uh, for other non identified or predefined beneficiaries, if you want, uh, so we don't have really a choice. So you have grants, but it's quite difficult in this context. And uh, so uh, that's what is used uh, for the member state uh, uh, activities. And then we have ITTs. I mean, we don't have a lot of choice. We cannot decide by ourselves to, uh, uh, to, to, to give money directly uh, to uh, uh, any kind of organization. So sorry for having having been long, but I think it's important to clearly separate the, uh, the both, even the, if they are mixed, but uh, we don't have really a choice. Uh. So, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think anybody wants to uh, add on top of that or to ask uh, other questions or reactions? Yeah. Now it seems to work, okay. Uh, it, it will probably not surprise you, all of that uh, I have a comment on, on your presentation. Uh, what, what I do regret, actually, is that at some point these uh, top-down and bottom-up approaches are still presented as a clash. That is, for me, not the issue. What we need is a shift of paradigm here. It's not meant to be a clash. It's meant to be complementary. And as Chris pointed out, and as you have seen in the slides this morning, one track is fading out, the other track is fading in. But the two together for a number of years will continue to, to exist, whether we like it or not. It's going to be like that. It's the only way we can deal uh, with the challenges that are brought forward from the various perspectives. So there's no other solution, basically, but to go for, for this kind of approach. And for me, it's, it's much more an issue of being uh, complementary. It's almost as if you would, and I'll make a comparison here, it's almost as if you would uh, put the same question forward in terms of uh, collecting environmental information as such. Do we rely only on in situ data collection for the environment? Or do we accept that from space observations, 
there is also a certain type of information that can be brought forward and that can be very much complementary to what the in situ data collection is delivering uh, for the environmental sector. There as well, you have this kind of complementarity. And that's also how I see this specific issue of, of top-down and bottom-up approach. It's just a temporary thing to make the whole uh, machinery working and, and yielding the, in, the type of information that we need. So please forget about the clashes. I mean, we're repairing the issue. I mean, there is a clash. I mean, the ideal world would be if we could use a bottom-up approach and if Inspire was available and so on. So we're just repairing. And I fully agree, in this process of repairing, there's a parallel process. Just to be, so maybe we can agree on that at least. And at the comparison, I don't, I, I don't quite agree on, 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 on that comparison. I mean, that's a, a supplementary data source, I, and I agree it is, and it should be. So. Um. Um, but I think it's important not to underestimate uh, the, the time and the efforts uh, required for the coordination of, uh, let's say, um, the, the, the contribution of the member states. I think that EEA has a long, long, long uh, experience with uh, uh, dealing with member states and uh, a long experience with uh, this bottom-up approach in Corinne Land Cover, as I said. And uh, there are advantages and there are also some constraints. Uh, of course, I mean, that's the ideal situation, but sometimes it's very difficult to put in place. And when dealing uh, on an administrative point of view, when dealing with uh, small grants to member states, uh, which provide a lot of, uh, ad uh, of administrative burden on EA, it's not so straightforward. And uh, so we have also to reflect a little bit on uh, how to uh, optimize uh, all of that. I I it's not easy. It's, an, uh, it's not an easy task. Mm. Any other reaction? Yeah. Torben Hansen from the Danish Geo Agency. Uh, it's uh, the, the topic I want to, to talk about is the uh, in situ data issue. Because as far as I understand, this is a very small part of the whole uh, Copernicus program. And uh, the in situ data is uh, a data component that is already being, has been decided to put, be put up as national ACIs. And I simply cannot understand the, the statement that uh, transferring money, EU money, to, to actually do something that is already recognized as national things to be done, uh, how that should not be possible. That's against what I've learned about EU law and right. I think that in terms of coordination, it's not a, a, a problem. I mean, there is no barrier, but then, when we're talking about transfer of money because member states, they have their own business model, model and uh, so they, they cannot afford or they don't want to, or they, I mean, they're not allowed as well to give their data for free. Huh? Uh, so that's the way it is at the moment. Uh, so then, uh, comes the, the, the uh, let's say, some ad hoc solution and uh, agreements or whatever, or we have to purchase the data uh, on from one way or the other. That's the reality we face. So maybe when Inspire will be fl fully implemented, we don't, we not have this problem anymore. I, I don't know, but I, I, I don't have this, I don't have the impression that it will solve really the issue of various and heterogeneous data policies, and uh, so that's not the case for all countries. But that's uh, okay. So. Jorgen Hartmann from Land Materiet. I will not prolong this discussion. I know it could go on forever and ever and ever. I just wanted to introduce an unexpected perspective. Now, if, if there was an, an, a normal European taxpayer listening to us, they would go bananas. 
Yeah? We are all civil servants. Now who's paying our salaries? Hmm? Who's paying your salaries? I am. When I'm sitting here being the taxpayer. So my my solution to this is to not to go into the nitty gritty details because there we will lose ourselves, I guarantee. It's the helicopter perspective or the drone perspective. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for um, for all these uh, interesting uh, interventions. So I feel that we are far behind uh, the schedule already, and uh, unfortunately we have to close the, the session. Uh, so it's um, let's say working progress. Uh, so we see that uh, um, there is already a lot done, and we still have some progress to be made. But uh, okay, interesting anyhow, and uh, so we will continue to cooperate and uh, uh, to, to continue with that. Thank you to all of you. And, uh